Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any Town Pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Town Pump. down the road. Pump it up. Oh, yeah. Well, Tuesdays with Tutel. Back for yet another week. Uh, nice stucco on the ceiling there, dude. And nice lid you got there, too. Alpine Touch. Hey. Chad and the boys. That's right. I appreciate it. You know, it's a lesson to be learned here. You want to promote your product on apparel, make it apparel that looks good and that people will actually wear, you know? So there well done by Alpine Touch and the uh, the Eckergrins there. And uh, I've actually had this hat for like a little while and I wear it pretty regularly, just including today. So thank yep. you very much. Yeah, very good. Well, a lot of time to get to today. Uh, we're going to talk some Masters. We're going to talk some NIL, of course we are. We're going to talk some Clifton McDowell, of course we are. We're going to talk some... Uh, other FCS storylines, some other Grizz basketball storylines, maybe even get to some cat football if we can by the end because uh, the Bobcat spring game is on Saturday, Sunny Holland Classic, so I'll be over in Bozeman uh, this upcoming Saturday. But uh, speaking of Alpine Touch and the boys, I just thought you'd f- find this story funny. So this last weekend, it was the Scotch Open in Coeur d'Alene uh, at the Coeur d'Alene Golf Course. You and I had the great pleasure of playing there several years in a row. Uh, great yep. friend Andy set us up and hooked us up there. And uh, now I, I haven't got a chance to go back there just because they're just so dang busy. They don't need any stay and play trades. They just, they got the full tee times across the board. Anyways, myself and Kyle Sample were supposed to play in the Scotch Open with uh, Chad, but then Sample got sent to San Diego for work and uh, I just couldn't swing because I had to do the Grizz spring game. But of course, uh, in the uh, the subconscious nature, I had this bizarre dream that me, Chad, and Sample were driving to the Scotch Open and that we got pulled over and that uh everybody's fine nobody's everybody's sober but that the cop says the only way i'm letting you guys not go to jail is if everybody shaves their heads and uh sample and chad both have nice hair i have no hair so i was like let's go i, I got my yeah. the back. let's do it and sample's <laughs> freaking out he's like i will not shave my hair i have great hair that's the dream it was a really weird dream but shout out to alpine touch and uh we'll get what, you back on what a lead here. Yeah, yeah, here we are. Uh, you <laughs> want to talk a little bit about the Masters, and I, I do too, because I, I find, um, first of all, I find what's happened in the post-Tiger Woods era. Tiger's still playing, and you and I are both impressed that he was even able to finish the tournament uh, after all the stuff he's gone through physically. But there's been this this pretty consistent narrative of, flashes of brilliance for a whole bunch of different golfers over the last 15 years and now the latest one is scotty scheffler and he's now into that little part where so many other guys have gotten to and when they get there the star burns so brightly that then all of a sudden maybe i don't want to say your star burns out but like the pressure starts to mount right and we've seen guys everybody from rory mcelroy to dustin johnson to jordan spieth to brooks kepka reach this peak this pinnacle and then have like this unraveling and then they're, i mean they're all still competitive but it's like you win two three four majors in a row or you know in the span of a couple of years and then you have a hard time getting back up there now that's where chef was at he's won two he's also won the players championship twice i think he's won 13 tournaments in the last 20 months or something absurd like that um is i guess what makes him different or the same is he is what he's done sustainable i mean that was a pretty nails sunday afternoon at augusta yesterday i mean it's just not close i have so much that i think about scotty um you know i don't know what we'll have time to get to i do think he's different from those other guys in a lot of in in some important ways but i think they're i think that golf is fickle too i mean even last year scotty tita green was like i don't know a million shots better than the field and couldn't pot to save his soul right. and actually didn't have a ton of wins because he just couldn't figure it out with his putter. Now he switches his putter to the, you know, the big blockhead, and he's just, and in fact, he wasn't even average. He was like a top five putter this, this week too. And I mean, if he's doing that, there's no even reason to show up if you think you're going to win a tournament and it doesn't matter who you are. But before we go, like you talk about Brooks Kafka, Rory McIlroy, Jordan Speed, like, 
These dudes are multi-time major winners. Do you know how rare that is? Oh, no, for sure. You know what I mean? And so, like, the idea of, well, we're never, like, Rory, yeah, Rory, when he won, what was it, like, three or four majors in two or three years and was as young as he was, we just thought, well, here we go. Like, the next dude who's going to win, is he going to win 10? Is he going to win, you know, 12 of these things? And because he hasn't, it's somehow, um, you know, a shortcoming. But what, if anything, it's unbelievable what he did in that span. And he still, I mean, he was the, the FedEx Cup champion year before last sure. and walked with $20 million or whatever it is. So it's not like he just isn't the dude. But, yeah, he, he hasn't won a major. We get that. And that's like, I mean, he, there's only a four of them a year. He's a little separate than these other guys, too, though, because, like, Rory has – Rory has, like, such a defined formula, right? Like, the thing that's irked him in majors is that if he plays red hot on Thursdays and Fridays, then he gets way too conservative on Saturdays and Sundays. Or if he plays bad on Thursdays and Fridays, he does this hard charge to get all the way up to seventh. So he's always finishing in the top mm-hmm. ten. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's, out, he's, he's outside of what I'm talking about. Like, Spieth hits it in the water on 12, and he's never been the same. He's, he's been he's been a, a – a, Average but not elite player for several years now. Yeah, Kepka had his great peak, and then I mean, if you watch the full season of Full Swing, this guy has lost his mind. Like he he's bleaching his hair like Eminem. He's he's remaking. But his then he sp- went and won another major after he did. that. He did. He's he got did. five. He's did. No, it's true. It's true. It's definitely true. So here here's the thing. Here's where here's I'm just gonna get into what I think is different about Scotty, and it's two big things, and. My guess is that particularly on my second opinion here, there's going to be a fair amount of pushback, and that's okay. But I, 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 I'm I, very firm about this. But the first thing is, and this, this is just a separation as a matter of fact, and it's so shocking to me. Every golfer and really every professional athlete that you see out there that is at the the pinnacle of what they do that are the elite of the elite, even, you know, for however space of time it is, they are in one degree or another. And very often, very, very, um, uh, 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 very obviously so maniacal, like they are there to take your soul away from you. And, and, Every, I mean, even Jordan Spieth with his baby face, like he's there to kill from a golf standpoint, right? And and the same with all these, and Tiger is the epitome of that. Like he's the most of the most of all time. Like my, Tiger and Michael Jordan are probably the two where you go, you. it's a good thing you found sports because the only other thing was just psychopaths on the street, you know, like. Right, or I mean, gambling like Jordan. Or was. yeah, like whatever, <laughs> like just insane people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And all these guys, of course, are competitors and all of that kind of thing. Scotty is just a guy. He's like, a guy. if you ran into Scotty Shuffle on the street, of course, at, you know, at this point, you know, as good as he is. But, like, I, I just don't feel like you'd be intimidated in some sense, right? right. You would just be like, holy cow. And I think it's a testament to just how good he is. It's like, I don't need to like go to bed dreaming about like asphyxiating the competition. Dude. I just go and hit my shots and I play golf and I'm better than everybody in every aspect of it. End of story. And, there's and it's certain, insane. There's a certain element here too, where have you read the legend of bagger Vance? I I haven't read it. I saw the show. I, 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 I'll send you the book. Cause it's, it's beautifully written. It's, and it's, it's an allegory. It's it's like a, a parable because it's about this golf thing. But the whole point of the book is swing your swing your swing. Swing your swing and swing your authentic swing. Just like be yourself. Just mm, being mm. who you are. And if you're trying to be fake, it's not going to work. You got to swing your swing. You got to be who you are. We've seen even Tiger at his peak remake his swing three or four times because he's a freak. Like you read the big miss by Butch Harmon. This guy's sitting on the driving range for 14 hours a day trying to fix his swing when it's not broken. He's won 10 majors and he thinks he needs to fix it because he's got to be better than that somehow, right? Rory's done the same thing. Kepka's done the same thing. Schefter's swing 
from the waist down is uh, as bad as it can be. He he's <laughs> he, I mean, he has the worst footwork of any major pro ever, really. I mean, it's mm-hmm. truly in the modern era for sure. And I think that's why he doesn't have to fixate on it though. Like you're saying, he doesn't have to eat, breathe, just, dream, sleep. He just hits just the go. ball. I think that's so true. And that dovetails into my second point. But before I get to that, even yesterday, first two, three holes, I think he was, I think he was short, like borderline missed the green short from the fairway on one and then airmailed it on two. But at no point was it like, oh, he's nervous. Oh, he's like, you know what? No, he's just like getting his distances dialed in. And sure enough, he gets to 16 and puts it to three feet because, you know, this is easy. I know exactly how far I need to hit it now. Like I got the temperature, I got the wind, I got it all like, I know where I'm going, and he just that was puts the most it in impressive spots. Part of yesterday is that he he had there was he gave two back, and then it's a three way tie, and yep. from that and maybe even a four way tie, and then from that moment forward, everybody else completely unravels, and he just eviscerates everybody. He had six birdies in the last ten holes. The 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 one guy who I didn't feel like really unraveled was Max. On twelve, he got. So excruciatingly unlucky to to get that kick and have an unplayable out of the back uh, uh, of 12. That said, he did miss his spot, and he missed it by two yards. But that's all it takes to then now you just got your ball just launched off the back of the, the little hill and the green into the shrubs, you know? And it's unfortunate because he deserved better than that. But at the end of the day, guess what? Even if he makes par there, he's losing by two or three because, because Scotty went, you know, birdie, birdie, par, par, birdie, par, birdie, par to finish. And it's just like you're just not in the same range as this guy. And and it's um it's insane. But here's where him just being like who he is and doing what he does, I'm gonna make a little bit of a of a of a metaphor if i can i don't know if this will work but we've talked before going back the years coulter what's one of the things that makes tom brady and peyton manning so good is that they they were never athletes in the sense of like a lamar jackson or even a russell wilson where they grew up just being able to get out of trouble using their legs you know these guys playing quarterback now Peyton Manning and Tom Brady only ever had to throw the football and get rid of it and make the read as fast as they could and get rid of it because they were never going to run from anyone ever in their whole life. Like, their fastest day is well north of a five-second 40. You know what I mean? In golf, I think more than any other sport, more than any other sport, the personal lives and specifically the relationships that these guys um, are in have a direct impact on how well they play. And golfing, even, I I really think this, man, even than uh, uh, other sports, just demands every single thing of you if you want to be great. Like, you just have to put in the time. And these guys who were great, Rory, Jordan Spieth, Brooks Kapka, when they were single, And when they could do whatever they wanted with all their time and they didn't have any other responsibilities and any kids and all that kind of stuff, they were great. And then as soon as your life finds just the littlest bit of what I would call balance, but what, you know, and this is, again, this is not a comp, like, you should have balance in your life. You really should. But guess what? You're probably not going to be the greatest that there is to be with balance like the tiger woods is the ultimate imbalance he's the he's the complete epitome of selfishness mm-hmm. and uh and and uh uh megalomania and it is only and always about tiger and that is what has made him great like that that's it yep. it's also what's made him insane you know so you can take it or leave it same thing with michael jordan yep these guys want to have lives. They want to get married. They want to have these, you know, relationships. They want to be parents. They want to, you know, it's not just always all about golf. That's fine. But guess what? Now you're top 20, not top one. I mean, this is and- Johnson in a nutshell, right? Dustin, Dustin Johnson said that when he went to live, he said, Hey, everybody wants to say this is about blood money and all these different things. He's like, 
I got three kids and I want to work one day less a week and I want to go to one less tournament a month and that's what I want to do. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, and, and good and good for him. And guess what? He, Dustin Johnson's got all the money on earth, but he's, he's sort of irrelevant as a golfer. Indeed. And that's fine. Like I don't, I'm not here to judge the choice. If anything, tip of the cap, but if you're talking about being great, but here's the thing. Now here's the metaphor for Scotty. Scotty's only ever been with Meredith. Scotty, other than other than Paula Gretzky, Paulina Gretzky, is probably the only wife that I can name by name of any of these professional golfers. They've been together since they were in high school. Scotty as a golfer is only Scotty as a golfer with Meredith as you know, his partner and then wife in a relationship. He didn't come up just doing his own thing and then have to like figure out how to split time and what, what, what. And now he's, he's about to become a father. We know that you especially now know what, you know, how impactful that can be and who knows what this will mean for him. But there is a level at which Scotty didn't have to be an athlete to then learn how to play quarterback in this sense. He's only ever been a professional golfer in a relationship with a very stable and obviously a very um uh, uh um helpful partner and and he's great and that feels somehow like it is more sustainable like his life anything could happen to anybody right we know that the crazy stuff can happen and befall us whether it's outside circumstance or something that we you know do to ourselves or whatever the case may be but in terms of like you just don't see something coming down the pike where all of a sudden Scotty Scheffler, you know, is having the window broken out of his SUV with a golf club. You know what I mean? Like that probably doesn't seem like it's going to play into Scotty Scheffler's story anytime soon. And to have that stability and to be just, I mean, this is the crazy thing. He didn't play better than everybody. He is better than everybody. Yep. Like, it's not just like, oh, he had a great week. No, he's better at all of this than all of them. And that is what is bonkers, because that doesn't happen in golf, man. It just doesn't happen. So what do you say? Like, what more can you say? He's the best golfer in the world. He's got two masters. And, I mean, he it, – it wouldn't shock me if he just does the Grand Slam. Like, who's going to beat this dude? That's right. He has he has none of the roller coaster that so many of these guys. None of them. None of it. I've been practicing for over 12 years. I was born and raised in Missoula. This is where I want to practice. This is my community. And I want to be there to help the people I grew up with. I began my legal career in the United States Marine Corps. And I moved to Missoula, Montana and began practicing. And I just couldn't imagine a better place to live. What inspired me to become an attorney is I really have a passion for people, especially helping people. What we do here at Holloway and Hulling is we represent people that are in a very difficult time of their life. And we're here to make sure that their rights are protected and they get what they deserve. Tuesdays with Tutel, presented in part by Holloway and Hulling, your advocates for justice in Montana. They are experts in criminal defense, personal injury, and family law. They've represented more than 2,000 clients over 25 years of experience, visit montanalawyers.net. On other Grizz football news, we did yeah. quite a bit of time on Clifton McDowell the other week. And since the last time we talked about him, uh, former Montana quarterback, he went from trying to beg his way back onto the Grizz team to then potentially walking onto the Grizz team to then uh, resurfacing at a practice at Prairie View A&M and the Prairie View A&M coach going on the record before this guy's even signed about how he's going to be there, which is a direct NCAA violation, but nobody's really coming down on Prairie View A&M. Maybe they will. I don't know. But either way, so this is on SI.com. It's on HBCU Legends, which is an extension of SportsIllustrated.com, and Clifton McDowell is allegedly going to Prairie View A&M. Well, then two days later, he's tweeting about how he's visiting at McNeese State, and then on Saturday morning, he announces that he's committing to McNeese State. What a saga. Uh, that's nine, count them, nine commitments to Division One schools throughout his life, Gus. This will be his, uh, if you count Temple, sixth T1 school. <laughs> I just, I don't know, man. I just think that by the time we finally figure out what the real story is, I don't think we will for a really long time. But I do think that there's probably more depth to this 
uh, in terms of what all went down to make this happen. But I just can't imagine that if you're really being rational and clear about it, that you could possibly say that Clifton McDowell found a better opportunity in Lake Charles, Louisiana, than he does in Missoula, Montana. Yeah, well, I mean, opportunities are are a little bit pegged to the individual, right? Like, obviously, nobody's going to say that playing, you know, football at Virginia is a better situation than playing football at LSU. However, there's probably a, a guy who got to start at a particular position that ended up going to the league because he went to Virginia and didn't and wasn't the backup at LSU somewhere along the line. Right. So, so it was a better situation for him, even though the, the team is obviously not a better team. I must say, I mean, I'm, I'm, you're interested in Clifton McDowell's whereabouts and what he's doing in virtue of having been like the most recent Grizzly quarterback, but it's a shoulder shrug to me. It's like, Hey man, he's going to land where he lands. He's going to play where he plays. And I I'm not that it's not, it's not that interesting to me, I guess. Like the fact that he's bouncing around left, right. I'll bet you could find 50 other kids with essentially this same thing where they went to, uh, you know, transferred out for an extra year of eligibility to go to a place didn't work out or chose not to end up going there. And then we're just trying to find a spot somewhere before spring ball started. And we're able to like find a landing spot. You know what I mean? Like I, I, who knows how this stuff works. And of course, when you're in the transfer portal and with the McDowell being both the, you know, the, the athlete that he is having the tape that he now has of having played for the Grizzlies playing and starting in a national championship game. Um, that's going to garner a lot of attention. And I'm sure there were, you know, plenty of schools that he was in contact with at least as a feel it out thing. Right. I mean, you, you would, you, you'll talk to whoever will talk to you. And I'm sure there's a lot of schools that are, you know, interested in bringing a guy on and seeing what he's got. And then he shows up and he, it doesn't feel good for him. Maybe it doesn't feel good for the team. And it's like, okay, well, thanks, but but no thanks, you know. Or he goes to Prairie View A&M, doesn't think he's going to have a shot at McNeese State, and then all of a sudden something at McNeese shows up and he's like, okay, well, actually I am going over here. I mean, it happens happens all the time. So there he is. He's at McNeese State. We'll see if he ends up actually staying there, you know, for the season. And best to him like i hope it works out what else is there to say i'm looking up mcneese state's uh cumulative statistics for the for those that don't know great basketball team mcneese state is a great basketball team that's what happens when you hire cheaters uh the <laughs> <laughs> mcneese state last year uh went a epic zero and 10 they did lead the Southland Conference, though, in attendance. I don't have an official number for you. Uh, I can tell you this. Southland is certainly a league that's gone through a lot of transition with Sam Houston State leaving and uh, several others uh, being in flux. So, I don't know, man. See, I think that sometimes you and I talk about this a lot. I think sometimes when we analyze this stuff, we analyze it as – the way that we like what we appreciate about football in Montana, right? Like we think, okay, the Grizzlies finished as the number two team in the country last year. They went to the national championship game. They played nine home games, almost every single one of them a sellout. You had these epic, you know, unforgettable moments within the history of the program, like a double overtime win against North Dakota state and a, you know, 30 point shellacking of Montana. And we think, man, how could someone think that there's anything better than this? I think a lot of players are probably on our same side of the fence on that. How could somebody think there's anything better than this? But it's completely, totally feasible. And in fact, probable and likely that there's lots of other ways to think about this as well. And I think that's where people get sort of crossed up. Like they think, how could Clifton McDowell possibly want this instead of that? Like, what if it's as simple as he just wants to be closer to his family? He's from Houston. What if he just doesn't like living in Montana? Like, that—that that, that is totally possible that a guy from Texas just doesn't like living in Montana. It's totally feasible. 
I don't know why anyone would assume anything about anyone. That's right. True. Yeah. Right. You know, like, I mean, there, there's, why would anyone ever transfer from LSU or Michigan or Ohio state or whatever? But guess what? Dozens of dudes do every single year. And all of the, you know, maybe it's a playing time thing. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a personal thing. Who knows what, but like, there's, there's, there's a million reasons why a million people do a million different things. And unless there's something either untoward or, um, you know, ugly or illegal going on, which we have no reason to think any of that, um, it's just, you know, it's just a kid figuring out where he's going to go and trying to land at a place where he can play football and, and, and has, you know, whatever influences, or the things that he likes or doesn't like that he's trying to do, you know, um, wh- you know, is it a situation where Bobby Howard or the coaching staff with a new, you know, with a, a, a new system coming in, you know, offensively said, you know what, man, like it's going to be, you're going to be hard pressed to play next year. Did that conversation happen? Did they say, Hey, we really want you to stay. We'd love to have you. We're, you're going to be, you know, start you know you're going to be the, the the number one guy coming into camp did they did they have that conversation we don't know and i don't know why how you even try and analyze anything when you when you don't have that sort of pertinent information so it's just another individual doing doing what he does and you want to go play at mcnee state then God bless. What is a jewelry design center? JDC is a family-owned business with deep roots in Montana. Why Montana? Because this community made us. Made us family. Made us artisans. Made us believe in love. Made us hometown heroes. Because this community made us shine. Why Montana? Because Montana is home. I, I really, th- there's a couple things that I've heard and I, that that's where I want to know a little bit more of the story. I, the two things that I've heard that I want to conf- confirm one way or the other is that I heard that he had, a, he had a, a several different people contact him, promising him false promises when it came to NIL deals and where he was going to be able to transfer. So he went into the Montana coaches and said, Hey, I need a guaranteed, I need a guarantee that I'm going to be a starting quarterback next year. I need to be able to make whatever NIL money I want at Montana. And of course, Bobby Howe and company said, that's not how it works around here. And so McDowell said, peace. So I, you know, if that's, if there's like some, some uh, street agent behavior on social media or whatever, that's con- tricking basically this guy into walking away. That's uh that's bad. We don't, like you said, we don't know any of that. So I, I just, I think there's a lot more to well, the story. And the other thing is, is Clifton McDowell going to be playing in the NFL? No. No. Is Clifton McDowell going to be playing in the CFL? Probably no. not. No, he's not. Guess what? He's got one year left to try and actually earn money, which he can now do playing college football. Sure. Maybe that's, I mean, it could be just as simple as that. Like McNeese State needed a quarterback, and guess what? Had a little pool in there, and he's going to get, you know, yeah. a few grand or whatever the case may be to, to, to do. I mean, again, again, this is complete speculation. And so go get it. Like, if you can get it, go get it. Here's here's my last thought on this, and then we'll move on. When this whole thing fell apart for him at Temple, and he was exploring coming back to Montana, just on the personal note of him, I am very glad he's not coming back to Montana. Because I think once that ship sailed, that ship sailed. If he comes back to Montana, what does that get you on either side of the equation? You're going to start out as the six-string quarterback in a five-quarterback room. If you're playing for Bobby Houck and you're trying to walk back on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And so then he's on your team. So then, okay, that's an inevitable distraction. Not that Bobby Houck cares about that kind of stuff, but like, it's like having Cam Newton as your backup before the world is, as has confirmed that Cam Newton is washed up. Mm-hmm. And it's also, just not a good opportunity for him. Like if Clinton McDowell walks back on, there's 0% chance he's the starter from stem to stern next year for the year. I should say zero, but a very slim chance. Yeah. I think too, though, like everybody is trying to learn. Well, maybe they're not trying to, but they should try to learn how to live in in the new world, which is consistently shifting dramatically in college athletics. Um, 
But I think in general, and this is true just about across the board, that the kids are way better at adapting than the adults are. And I don't think that like Clifton McDowell coming back would be any type of problem as long as he was a good dude and people liked him in the locker room and that kind of thing, which I have no reason to think otherwise. It's like, hey, yeah, he was going to go to Temple and he'll come back and be like, oh, you know what? I went over there. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be or they they weren't straightforward with me and I, I just wanted to be back here. And it's like, okay, nobody feels like personally affronted. Dude, you left Montana and now you want to come back. Like all that. But the coaching might. You know, the coaching might approach totally. it that way, that way. For uh, another example of this, though, just sort of relates, but Jack Calipari goes to Arkansas. You know how many, how many kids are on the Arkansas basketball roster right now? One. <laughs> One dude is on the roster. So John Calipari is having a press conference, probably the most famous college basketball coach in America, with with no team. He goes, I met with the team today. He said it tongue in cheek. He goes, and I'll tell you what, John is really confident, but he's going to need some help. So we got to find a team. <laughs> he was like, and it's just, and you know what? No one like this is normal, right? The Arkansas doesn't have a team and they just paid $8 million for a coach. Like that's, that's what we're doing. And I don't think anybody cares. Like, that a bunch of guys who haven't been Arkansas Razorbacks before are going to come in and play basketball for Arkansas next year. Right. That's the, and, double, that's the double standard, right? Is no fan base cares for the guys that are coming in. They only care about the guys that are going out. Right. I, you know, I, yeah, I've heard I mean, this. I've thought about this so much the last couple of weeks because it's just like, we're going back to the original point. Grizz football means the absolute world to so many people for better or worse. It yeah. means the absolute world Not for better. Yeah. But they can't, they could never possibly understand how it couldn't mean the world to you. Like Clinton McDowell had his whole, the battle of the brawl or whatever thing last year. And everybody was right. like, this guy doesn't even know what the game's called. This still doesn't even matter to him. And that was a yeah. straight dead weakness of his. And look, man, if you're going to go play someplace, like if you're going to interview for a company, do some research on the company. Find out what 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 their strengths are, where what their niche is in the industry, who their CEO is. Like, find out some stuff so that you can have you know a a a, a foundation to pull from when you're having a conversation about this. You need to know what people call the game that's the biggest game of the year if you're on the team. Like, you just do. Um, so I actually do dock in points for that, but I dock the fan base points. For just the, the 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 idea that like this is as big a deal to everybody else as it is to them, and by the way, this is I mean all college, especially football fan bases are are lunatics. They're they're all out of their minds. That's right. And I say that collectively, individually, they're great, right? But like, let me tell you something, and. Missoula's my home. I'm trying to move back to Missoula right now. And you know me, Coulter. I've been I've been about as many paces as a guy my age could be, both domestically and abroad. I've been around the world. I've been around the country so many times. And I'm I'm trying to move back to Missoula. And if somebody wants to sell me a house at half price, I will appreciate that. But I understand, and 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 let me even put a finer point on it. Not in a million years would I live in Houston. Like, I want nothing to do with Houston. But there's 5 million in p- people in Houston that would come to Missoula and go, you're out of your mind if you think I'm living here. I'm going back to Texas. You know what I mean? And it's like, hey, that's fine. Some people like broccoli. Some people don't. Whatever. Like, however you want to split it up. And it's it's who you are, how you raise, whatever. And a lot of people playing a lot of college football are not from the places that they go play. And that, and that doesn't mean that Clifton McDowell didn't have a great experience playing for the Grizzlies. It just means that, like, he did what he did, and now he's going to go do whatever the next thing is, you know? So you're, you know, you're just, everybody's from wherever they're from, and that's the way it is. And it's a very rare thing, Colter, is it not, where guys, uh, gals, whoever, athletes, come to play at the University of Montana that are not from Montana 
and then stay in Montana when they're done. Like, even if they're four-year, five-year players, athletes, you know, it's 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 just rare that that they go ahead and go like, you know what, this is my home, this is where I want to be. It does happen. But and and why how many people that went to college out of state made that place their new home? It happens. Right. But I mean, I, mean, I went to say, college. What do they say? Like eight out of ten Americans live twenty miles from their hometown. Right. Yeah. Something like yeah. I mean, something like that. Or, or and, like the place they were born or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And and by the way, I mean, when I went to college in Washington State, I actually did live in Washington State for about six, eight years after the fact and loved it. I actually consider Western Washington a, a second home for myself, but I came full circle and I, I think a lot of other people do. So last we are. About this, I, I, I was thinking about this. I, I think that there's also this, like, because there's such this us or them mentality, not just when it comes to college football, but it's in America right now. It's either you're on my side or you're evil, you know? Right. Like right. I heard a great, uh, who was it? Some political analyst the other day said for years and years and years, we used to think, Oh, that guy on the other side of the aisle is a guy with bad ideas. Now we think that guy on the other side of the aisle is a bad guy. Right. He's yeah. an evil person yeah. with bad ideas instead of just being a person who has bad ideas different from my ideas. It's a fundamental yeah. change. But yeah. I think that's the thing that people haven't considered within this. I think that a lot of people that have followed the Clinton McDowell saga think, okay, good riddance. Uh, you know, you want to go do this. You want to go test these portal waters. You know, you get what you deserve. Have fun at Owen 10 McNeese state. I think other people think, how are we ever going to replace Clifton McDowell? He led the Grizz to the national championship game. I think there's a scenario here that hardly anybody's considering. And that is that both parties could be better off with a win, win. Right? right? Yeah, Montana totally. could have a better quarterback that could lead them to higher heights. And Clifton McDowell could have a better experience at McNeese state. And both those things can be true. Or a better experience at McNeese state than what he would have had again at Montana. It's right. not even comparing McNeese state now to his time with the Grizzlies last year. Sure. McNeese state ain't going to a national championship. He's not going to have a better football situation in sure. terms of wins uh, you know, and, and co competition than what he had with the Grizz. But yes, that's to your point. Like it, it doesn't all it, like this whole binary best, worst, good, evil, right, wrong, whatever. Like, no, like it's okay. It can just be okay. It can just be okay. We don't have to have a culture war about everything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two more things to get to Tuesdays with two tell uh, probably presented in part by old works golf course, old works golf course, a gem in Montana. You need to go play this course if you've never had before. you got to really buckle up, though, because it is uh, as hard of a course as there is anywhere in the Northwest. It's the longest course in the state of Montana. And uh, if the wind's Jack blowing. Jack Nicholas design. Oh, buddy. If the wind's blowing, you better buckle up. you got to hit it. you got to yeah. be able to hit it pretty good. But it's a really fun course right there in Anaconda. Uh, so go check it out now that golf season is back upon us. Okay, so they moved the, uh, the day of the national championship game for the FCS. I can't see anything but a positive with this. You know, there was this for the last couple of years where they said, okay, because they, they moved this thing off of ESPN onto ABC, but they had to then be on, they had to play on Sunday ABC because ABC is the one network that doesn't have the NFL. So then they're okay. You're, you're, their argument was we're going to have way more viewers being on network television than we would on ESPN, but we're going heads up with the NFL on the last week of the regular season. And they also used to, the, uh, the powers that be were also arguing, well, so many of the great teams sit their players the last week of the regular season. Well, now there's no such thing as a non big time NFL Sunday. Everybody's gambling on everything. They're all playing fancy football. There's a reason to watch every single game all the time. Right? So moving this thing now to a Monday night, Monday, January 6th, is when this is going to happen. I think being at night, being on a Monday as a standalone game, not competing with the NFL, that's an equal, if not advantageous trade to be moving off of ABC and back onto ESPN. What say you? Uh, everything about this is the right choice. Um, the NFL is about to play two games on a Wednesday because that day is Christmas, and they are going to eviscerate the NBA on that day. Just like they did last year. So... 
if you think that, oh, week 17 and quote unquote, you know, resting starters NFL is going to be, oh, well, we'll just switch over here and watch the FCS national championship from Frisco. You got another thing coming. Um, the other thing is just to be a, a primetime standalone national championship. I mean, I watched a little bit of the division two basketball national championship because it was the only game on at that time um, on, on whatever that Saturday was uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is, this is perfect. And I'll also say, um, obviously ESPN and ABC being part of Disney and then thereby sharing content and having, you know, we know that like the NBA, for instance, is on ESPN, ABC as a co-feature almost depending on when and where, but the reality is, is that ESPN is sports and ABC is variety um at least with some sports content in there i think it's an advantage to be on espn on a nationally spotlighted game as opposed to abc like there the first of all the separation between quote unquote network television and and cable television is as small as it's ever been and shrinking by the day but also um okay so I'm I'm making these numbers up, okay? But let's say there's 20 million viewers of ABC on a Monday night primetime or even on a Sunday day deal. But 18 million of those are not looking for sports. They're looking for family feud, right? They want to see Steve Harvey do his thing up there. And by the way, so do I, because I love Steve Harvey. But the point is, is like if you're on ESPN, this is what you should be on. Is ABC on in all the sports bars in America? No, it is not. Right. ESPN is on. That's so right. put it on there. Let it run. Having a national spotlight. And it should be a primetime game. You know, I, I there's just something wrong to me about playing a national championship game, and it's not under the lights. It should be under the lights. You yeah. know, it, it should be. I think it's going to create an even better vibe, a better atmosphere, and a, and a lot more viewers. It's, it's, it's the right move for sure. Is a will you marry me in your future? Or maybe you do it all over again. Hi, I'm Brian Toon with Jewelry Design Center, inviting you to come see the largest selection of will you marry me in the state of Montana. The brightest diamonds of every shape and size, unique settings built to last, and skilled jewelers on site offering free sizing and maintenance for life, because that's how long we want to be your jeweler. Jewelry Design Center in Missoula, on Brooks, across from the Montana Club. Tuesdays with Tutel here on uh, the Big Sky Breakdown Podcast Extension, as well as our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, two more things to get to. One, when it comes to the Grizz basketball front, they graduated five seniors and also then had their sixth senior, Jordan Williams, who was uh, could have come back for another year. He entered the portal. Then they had a couple more guys enter the portal, most of them just roster guys like Caden Bateman and Rhett Reynolds, but then also Jackson Knapp, who played a fair amount uh, last year. But then one of those seniors announced yesterday that he's coming back, Brandon Whitney, who's been a four-year starter for the Grizz. And, you know, you're you're you're, you're making assumptions here, but you're assuming he's going to be a five-year starter. Uh, this is unique for a couple of reasons. I think Whitney's a a good player. You know, I, he's, he's not a great player, but he's a good player. And I think he's a consistent player. Uh, but the, the the two things that popped into my mind right away, first of all, from a record standpoint, this guy's already scored 1,296 points. He's also got 350 assists. He's definitely for sure in range to become the all-time leader in assists in program history. He would break the record of Travis DeKir. Coach mm. DeKir played at Montana for three years. He played his first year uh, at Chaminade in Hawaii. So Dakir will have played two less years than Brandon Whitney if Brandon Whitney somehow figures out a way to to break. I his... see Brandon Whitney getting benched about two assists shy and just <laughs> riding her out. Sorry, buddy, can't let you do it. <laughs> I know. So that was my first thought. My second thought was that the 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 block that Montana has to build around is Money Williams, and he's a guy that a lot of people didn't get to see a lot of because he was their best player during the non conference, and then he got hurt and he didn't play during the conference. He played, I guess, like five minutes against Idaho State in one conference game, but that's it. And the Grizz fundamentally changed. When Money Williams was their guy, Brandon Whitney was basically coming off the bench and, and was not the starting point guard. I think that that actually ignited Whitney into being an all-league player this year because when Williams was out, then Whitney was like, oh, this guy's here. He's taking my spot. I got to be better. 
So I, I guess it's a two-part question. I guess, first of all, what do you think of the concept of a guy having a fifth year at the same program? This is pretty much unprecedented, when, at least when it comes to Grizz basketball. And secondly, from a basketball standpoint, how do they manage this? Because Whitney's got to be on the ball because he can't really shoot. Williams can play on and off the ball, but you probably want him to be on the ball. Uh, where are we at just with uh, the managing of these two ball-dominant guards? Well, from the standpoint of the fifth fifth year thing, I think nothing about it because I everything like from COVID to NIL to transfer portal to everything is just like yeah, nothing's like it used to be. And so now a guy's playing. You could tell me he's playing his eighth year, and I wouldn't even bat an eye. Like okay, I love so, that you move to the point of not care. You're just like you just don't care about it whatsoever. I, I love that about you. Well, and here's the here's the thing is if anything. Um, it's not even that it's a fifth year. I mean, it's that it's a third and a fourth and now a fifth year that a guy stayed and stuck with a program and stuck with, you know, coach to cure and, and, and that coaching staff and, and the university. And even to the extent where he's getting an additional year of eligibility and going to stick it out, you know, stick it out, but play obviously wants to be here. Uh, you know, he wants to play for the Grizzlies. And I think that's, that's a testament to both sides of that equation. As I said earlier, Arkansas has one person on their roster. So like the idea of starting a, a you know, over brand new is just going to be the norm, man. Like you're going to have, consistently 60 70 80 percent roster turnover every year i just think that's what i think that's where we're at so does you just got to make does it hurt huh? the overall does it hurt the overall product in basketball absolutely it does i agree and i think that was the most undertold story about the the women's tournament being much more visible than the men's tournament this year everybody wants to say it's because of this sweet girl from iowa who shoots the lights out and all these stories you know like heroes and the villains and all this sort of stuff well part of that the storytelling and the character making is you had real rematches of of teams that were largely the same. Like Iowa got to get revenge against LSU and then South Carolina got to get revenge against Iowa and it's the same players. Now, it, like what the heck does like the Kentucky-Alabama rivalry mean in, in basketball now? It doesn't matter. None of those guys have ever played in it before. Well, it does matter because the fan bases are are – the fan bases and they are going to hate each other forever and always, no matter who's wearing the uniform. Right. So, but um, also to your point though, when it comes to the men's national championship, tremendous consistency uh, in terms of from last year to this year, in terms of those players, I mean, you had, you had, you know, your best players on Purdue returning from the year before and even two, right. two years back. Um, and, and they made a run all the way to the end. And I know that UConn la lost two or three of their best players from last season, I think to graduation, well, uh, not even to transfer. The they got, they got three guys at the NBA and then one other graduated and didn't go to the NBA. Right. But it's not like they had a bunch of transfers come in and it was a brand new roster. Like a lot of the guys playing on that team were on the roster and yeah, they brought in a couple other players who hadn't been on the team before to fill those holes but i mean there again there's just like a lot of consistency um of guys who've been in the program and i do think that's something that brandon whitney really brings you can call it leadership if you want you can call it just being accustomed to the culture and what travis decure you know is and what he wants to do and what he wants to instill from a basketball standpoint and having a guy who knows what that is who can as a as a member of the team and presumably a starter on the team um exemplify that um to whoever's coming in i think is a big deal and important to um to particularly travis decure who has who's who's a culture heavy a culture emphasis type of coach and and um and needs guys to buy into the way that they that he wants to do things um that said it's going to be a brand new thing pretty much every year where you're going to have to you're going to have to institute the culture you want, but you're also going to have to articulate it to the specific individuals that you have. Like gone, I think are the days of this is what we do. This is Montana basketball or whatever. This is UCLA yeah. basketball. You come and you bend to this. It's like, Hey, we got some things that are, that are foundational that we're about here. Also, what are you guys about? What do you need from us to be your best, you know? And, and, and obviously from a basketball standpoint, but also from a, 
from a methodology standpoint, right? I think that that there has to be that give and take. So um, we'll see how it goes. But I, I think that it's nothing but a good thing for the Grizzlies that Brandon Whitney's coming back. From a basketball standpoint, it's okay. You've got two ball, ball dominant guards. There's going to be six, seven, eight more guys coming in on the roster. What are they going to look like? How are they going to work together? Who are the guys that are ultimately going to sign? And that's, I mean, the roster construction is going to be paramount to success and you know that's going to be on the shoulders of 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 coach to of chris cobb and the rest of that staff to to put that together this year one sec we gotta have a guest appearance here on tuesday the two tell be right back. oh yes oh i can't wait for this i've been practicing for over 12 years i was born and raised in missoula this is where i want to practice this is my community and i want to be there to help the people i grew up with I began my legal career in the United States Marine Corps. And I moved to Missoula, Montana and began practicing, and I just couldn't imagine a better place to live. What inspired me to become an attorney is I really have a passion for people, especially helping people. What we do here at Holloway and Hulling is we represent people that are in a very difficult time of their life, and we're here to make sure that their rights are protected and they get what they deserve. All right, Tuesdays with Tutel, back with the babies. Here we are. Uh, okay, so last one. Uh... On a Bobcat football note, Sonny Hall and spring game, we had very spirited debate that actually lasted four full days on the radio show last week about who's more irreplaceable for their respective teams, Clifton McDowell for the Grizzlies or Sean Chambers for the Bobcats. I was very passionate that it was Sean Chambers. The question is not who's better. The question is who's more irreplaceable because Montana State, they've run a two-quarterback system for the duration of Tommy Malott's career. He is such a great player in terms of just his ability to manage this unique offense that they run. He gets hurt though. It's not his fault. He's, he's just a fearless dude. Who's just not that big. And that that's just how it goes. And they also run him too much in my personal opinion, because he's going to figure out a way to run 20 times on his own. You don't need to call like design quarterback power for this guy. He's going to find his way to get 20 carries either way, but thank you, Marty. <laughs> hey, <laughs> It, with the offensive coordinator for the uh, the Philadelphia Eagles tells you what it is, you take his take and you run with it. That's how it goes. It's absolutely right. Uh, but does Montana State need to – and to give you the breakdown, if, you, if you're not following their quarterback situation, they have Jordan Reed, who's like a 6'6 thrower. Like, Vegan wants him to be like his poor man's Josh Allen, basically. He doesn't have the juice Josh Allen's got, but like a guy that's big, strong arm, run a little bit. And then they have a couple other guys that are way young that are probably not in the mix. Do the Cats need to keep running a two-quarterback system, though, so you have a guy who has game reps in case Tommy Block gets banged up? What do we think? Uh, do, do we think we're going to see multiple looks out of them, both in the spring game and moving forward? Well, there's a difference between a two-quarterback system and a competent backup in the event of an injury. Um, and if you're – like, of course you need that. And also, if you're going to run a one quarterback system, excuse me, I'm talking. Thank you. Um, if you're going to run a, a a one quarterback system now where Tommy Malott's just the guy, I think you do need to adjust how you're using him and what you're doing because he is going to get hurt. Um, no question, Sean Chambers is the harder and more important piece to replace. That said... I thought that the way he went used or unused down the stretch last year anyways was completely bizarre. And I didn't understand the way that he was employed by Montana state for a good portion of the year and especially down the stretch. So it's almost like, well, you know, uh, his, I, I don't know how effective he actually ended up being or, or the way that he was or wasn't used in any case. But I mean, you can only replace, certain guys with what you've got and if you you know if you don't have a sean chambers sitting in the wings to come back and do that again now you're going to have to adjust what you do overall and i think that's a big part of what the spring game is there to try and figure out right like what do we have here who are the dudes who can play what are their strengths what are their skill sets where do we need to improve and what sort of offense are we going to put into place to like make this work so that's that's what i think um, you know, it are big, big questions that need to be answered for Montana State. But um, obviously, you know, you have your centerpiece in place and Tommy Malott, that's a good thing. And now you need to figure out what you're going to do around him, both maybe with other quarterbacks and also in general to uh, to to maximize what you've got. 
the fact is that they were able to run the same offense the last couple of years with these two quarterbacks. Now it's going to have to be a different offense. So do you I think play so. Jordan? I mean, I think they just need to get Jordan Reed in game so he knows how to do it. Yeah, and I mean, again, you know, that's part of what the 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 spring game is there to do. And it doesn't have to be a wholly different offense. I mean, it's still Tommy Malott. You can do a lot of the same stuff, but you're going to have to probably add to it and put some stuff in there that's specific to, you know, Jordan and, and whatever he can do. So I think that's – that's um but that's every year, right? Like this isn't this isn't different. I mean, the Grizzlies are gonna have to put in a new offense. They have new coaches anyways in a lot of spots, but they also are gonna have obviously a new quarterback playing also. So they're gonna have to figure out, okay, well, what does it look like in 2024? And that's that's the job. Like that's the job, right? Of a coach. Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any town pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com rewards to register and start saving. Town.